to Bethel Baptist Church this morning. Would you stand and let's open our worship on this very special weekend for Memorial Day by singing, We Will Glorify the King of Kings. Sing it out with me. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to today and as we've gathered together here in our church let me just uh, tell you a couple first off don't forget silence your telephones and then the second thing is today we're going to be having communion at the end of the service and if you did not receive one of these little communion sets uh, there's some men that have them on the trays be glad to bring it to you if you'll just raise your hand they'll bring it around to you anybody need one and I also want to tell you that if, even if you're at, uh, at home on Facebook or wherever you might be and uh, you would like to have communion with us, if you would, gather something that would help you to be able to be reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus. And if anything else, just uh, a piece of bread and some water. Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he also talked about how that if we drink of him, we'll never thirst again. So he's also the water of life. And so we even want you to even worship with us even in those ways. And so thank you for being here today. Let's look at a call to worship verse of scripture, very appropriate for this weekend. John 15, 13, read with me aloud. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And that is so true because Jesus Christ is the one that showed us that great example. Brother Jeremy, come and lead us in our invocational prayer, please, sir. Good morning. After a couple of weeks out, not being able to be here, it's so great to see all of you here today in the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time you give us together, for all the blessings you give us, blessing us with health so we can be here together and worship together, Lord. Please open our hearts and minds to the scripture and the word that Daniel will be presenting to us today. Lord, on this, this wonderful weekend, Memorial Day weekend, help us to remember to honor the fallen who gave so much and sacrificed so much in their lives so that we could be here and worship together for the freedoms this country has. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have a very special service today. As we observe Memorial Day tomorrow, we plan this service around honoring those that have given their lives for our country. So we're going to open our service this morning again with the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, which is the official hymn of the U.S. Navy and has a wonderful, powerful message. Let's sing it together. Mighty ocean deep. 
so that we could be able to have this blessing of being able to meet together and to be able to worship our God without fear of persecution or even death. So freedom is something in which we all enjoy, but freedom is something that certainly came at a high price. In our nation, we pause on this weekend not to celebrate, but to remember and to reflect upon those in whom have given their lives on battlefields and for those families who still remember and suffer the loss. And so during this time, we want to pause now 
and to be able to give us an opportunity to not only reflect, but also remember, but also to be able to give God thanks for the blessings in which he has bestowed upon us. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies glow in Flanders field. As we come to this time of prayer with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, as we hear the sound of taps being played, may we give thanks to the Lord for our freedom and pray for those families who still grieve this day.
Our Father God, we come to you on this beautiful day. And Father, being reminded, Lord, of our freedoms in which we are able to celebrate here in this great nation in which you have blessed. And God, you have blessed us in ways, Father, in which we want to just use those blessings, Father, to be able to be a blessing to you. And Father, we know that we do so whenever we share our blessings with others. And Father, right now, we ask, God, that we as your children, Father, would seek your forgiveness. Lord, where we have taken these blessings for granted. And God, where we have called evil good. And Father, where we have allowed sin to triumph. And Lord, where we no longer, Father, desire to be led by your Holy Spirit, but instead by the flesh. And God, we come, Lord, asking for your forgiveness. Lord, we also come to this time, Lord, and, and saying thank you, God, that you have given us a nation in which we can come and celebrate in. Father, your great love for us. Forgive us, Lord, where we failed to do so. And Lord, where we take these times like Sundays, Lord, for granted. And God, we thank you, Lord, for the freedoms of Lord where we might be able to bro boldly proclaim the gospel, the good news. But yet, Lord, so often we remain silent. But God, we come this moment right now, Father, and we ask, God, your blessings, Lord, to be bestowed upon those families who still grieve in this great hour. Father, of them remembering and reflecting upon their loved one, Lord, that laid down their life for our country. And we pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to them as only you can, Father, in real and personal ways. And Father, bringing, Lord, wisdom and, Lord, also comfort. And God, help us, Lord, as the church to never take these things for granted. But, Lord, be your arms, your eyes, your ears, your feet, Lord, to go and to minister. And so, Father, as we think about death this weekend, Father, we thank you, Lord, that it's not the end for us. But God, we do want to remember those who gave their lives, Lord, so that we could be free, but none greater than that of your son, Jesus Christ, who died to set all men free. Thank you, God, for giving us your son, Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue with our worship this morning by singing, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Would you stand with me as we sing? God said his Because he lives, sing it out now. 
song is dedicated to those that have given their lives in service for a country that have passed on before and that are alive today. They serve this country honorably a people strong and proud never wants to compromise they strive to be the best this nation is the land they love to honor and obey Qualities that make someone a hero for today. And the silent cheering from above somehow tells them that we're proud. And as we bend our knees to pray, may we find a way to say, Thanks to a hero for today. When you stand for freedom, you sometimes stand alone. Defending our America on shores so far from home courageous moments anytime and a flag that points the way on this lifelong journey on a hero for today and the silent cheering from above somehow tells us that we're proud and as we bend our knees to pray may we find a way to say thanks to a hero thanks to a hero and the silent cheering from above somehow tells them that we're proud and as we bend our to pray, may we find a way to sing, thanks to a hero for today, and as we bend our knees to pray, may we find a way to sing, thanks to a hero, a freedom loving hero, thanks for a hero for Yes, with this being Memorial Day weekend, I want to take the opportunity and talk about something that is not very popular, and that is I'm going to talk to you about death. You know, death is one of those kind of things that is like taxes. You can't, you know, you can't avoid it. It's going to happen, is it not? You know, and so often whenever we only hear about death or we talk about death in the church is usually at a funeral. 
And so with this being Memorial Day weekend, it is a time for us to remember those who have died in service so that we can have our freedoms today. And so I want to take this opportunity and talk to you about this touchy subject called death. In fact, we don't even a lot of times even want to call it death. We want to say things like, well, they've just passed on. Or we'll say things like, they bit the dust. Or they bought the farm. Or they kicked the bucket. Or as some would say, they joined the angels. Whatever, however you might want to say it. We try to avoid this whole topic, this whole subject matter about death. You know, but yet it is something that has been with man ever since the existence of man. And I can promise you this, each and every one of us in this room has been touched by death. You have known someone that you loved, that you knew personally, that you cared for, that has died. Have you not? Now, sometimes it might be somebody that, uh, that was very close to you. It might have been a spouse. It might have been a child. It may have been a parent, a grandparent, another kind of relative, and whom you grieve deeply for, and understandably so. But we also know that there's times in which we might grieve over somebody that was a dear friend that that dear friend was like family to us. I think about right here at Bethel Baptist Church. With me being your pastor, I can tell you that each time that we have had a funeral for one of our dear members here, I grieve because it's like one of my family that is no longer going to be here with us. And for the last 15 and a half years, I have memorized where most of you like to sit. A few of you have moved from the front, moved from your favorite pew. You've moved to a different kind of pew, but for the most part, you still sit where you normally do. And even this last year, with us even having to mark off the pews, you had to find a new pew. And even if that tape came down, you're liable to still sit somewhere close by. I want you to think with me just for a moment this morning. I want you to think about church members that you used to see sitting in certain pews. You know, I can think about different ones and where they used to sit as I would stand here in this pulpit of my passion and I would look out and I would see and I would know and, and it's kind of like where I could take role and I could remember certain ones. And there's been too many funerals for me to try to even talk about today. Y'all have certainly kept me busy in that aspect of ministry. But you know, one of my favorite ones, and not the funeral, but one of my favorite people that has now gone on to be with the Lord, was a little lady named Miss Lillian Payne. Miss Lillian used to sit right over here. And you say, what was so special about her? She was only, what, 104, 105, whenever she passed on to glory? 106, yes, she was 106. She was 106 years old whenever she went on to glory. That one you remember. Because even whenever she was in her 90s, and even after she turned 100, she was still here. I mean, you know, and kind of put to shame, you know, the younger folk who were like, I don't, you know, I just don't feel like getting up and going and everything. Hey, if a hundred-year-old woman can get up and come to church, what's your excuse? <laughs> but, you know, I, I think about all these funerals and, you know, and, and death has moved very close to us in this last year with all the deaths that have happened with COVID. Not only with those who have passed away due to the, 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 due to the pandemic of COVID, but how it also has changed our perspective on death. And, and that is about how that certain things that we used to do whenever we knew that somebody was going to pass away, like gathering at the hospital and maybe being in the room with them, or maybe being at a hospice house, or, or maybe being in a hospital room, or, or even at their own home, being close to that person, but too many, because of this pandemic, did not have that family, those friends, by their side. But to the Christian, Jesus was there. And there is where we can find that there is so much more than just the body dying. You know, in the book of Job, he asked this question, 
If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. Yes, death is one of those things where even the change of address. And from 2 Chronicles chapter 5, I want to read to you what Paul was saying here. Now, let me kind of set just a little bit of the scene for you because th this letter in which Paul writes to the church there in Corinth is, is, is not just, hey, I think I'll just sit down and write a letter. And that is that Paul was having to address some very critical doctrinal issues facing the church. For you see that after Paul had already gone there and already left, there were some that came along that were pretending that they were apostles, pretending that they were from God, and they were not from God, they were not apostles. And where God plants a garden, you can make sure that Satan is always going to throw his weeds in there as well. And these weeds, these men had come in and began to undo so much of what Paul had set into motion for God and for his kingdom. So God then led Paul to write this letter back to correct some of the false doctrines that were going on. Here, right now, we live with a lot of false doctrines. For instance, the false doctrine of atheism. An atheist says, there is no God. And an atheist is also one that would say that whenever I die, I'm just going to cease to exist. My body will turn back into dust, the worms will eat me, and that's it. There's no more. And a lot of the Eastern religions, they'll tell you that, oh, you have been alive and dead and alive and dead and alive and a dead many, many times since the beginning of time called reincarnation. And even with even another religion in which we're very familiar with, Islam, and that is where they believe that you live your life, you die, and then God, not the same God in which we know, that God then will judge you and determine how many good deeds you did as to whether or not you were worthy to be able to receive the gift of eternal life and to be able to receive an afterlife. You see, those are all faults. And so therefore we bring it back into what we know and we have the blessing of what Paul addressed against the false doctrines then to be able to help us to be able to address the false doctrines of today. So from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read these in the first 10 verses. As we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing for we will put on heavenly bodies we will not be spirits without bodies while we live in these earthly bodies we groan and sigh but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us rather we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life god himself has prepared for us this and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we're always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body, or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Will you bow with me and pray for me and pray with me? Father God, as I come, Lord, to your pulpit of your passion, Father, that you have placed me in, I pray, God, that you would give me clarity of thought right now. And, Lord, give me clarity of, of spirit. And Lord, also that of speech. For, Father, I desire, Lord, not to 
not to do anything, God, but to preach you. And Lord, to glorify you. And Lord, to present the truth. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit bring us, Father, into the reality of what your word has taught us. And so, God, use these next moments, Father, to glorify you. And Lord, to be a Lord, for us to be drawn closer to you as we understand, Father, you, your Son, Jesus, the moving of the Holy Spirit, and Father, our lives in you, and even death. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In our great nation, since this is Memorial Day weekend, we're going to think about death tomorrow. A Memorial Day weekend is nothing more to you than just a long weekend, as one politician recently said, or a barbecue, or time at a lake, or what are the official beginning of summer. You've missed the whole meaning of what this weekend is really all about. Here in our great nation, since the Revolutionary War of 1775 to present, there have been over 1.3 million military personnel that have died for the freedom of our country. Our country is barely over a couple of hundred years old. We're still a child as far as a nation goes compared to other nations that have been around for thousands of years. But yet in our short amount of time, we have certainly known our fair share of something called war. And even whenever there was not an actual war where there were troops on the ground and bombs being, being dropped from the air, we were still in a war. We just called it the Cold War. And even during even the Cold War, there were ones that wore the uniform that died in the freedom of our nation. But 1.3 million people have died so that we could have this kind of freedom. But let me assure you of this. There's only been one that ever died for you to be able to save your soul, and his name is Jesus Christ. So that's why on this weekend we desire to want to know Christ and his fullness and to be able then to focus on him and to be able to know what God is going to do in us, in our lives, and even in our death. You see, there's three aspects to this thing called death, and that is it does end our physical life. You know, in the scriptures in which we just read, Paul is here telling us, for it is written that our earthly tent will live, will be taken down. Yes, that old tent, he's referring to our bodies. You know, this old body in which we live in, it's designed only to last only so long. Now, unfortunately, none of us were born with an expiration date stamped on our heel, and we know when that day is going to actually end. Some people are not blessed to be able to live a very long life. Some lives have, have ended in just a matter of moments after birth. Unfortunately, a lot of lives have even ended even before they even were born. And then we also know that some tragically died whenever they were young, and then others died whenever they were of a great age. And I can tell you that there's this time in our life where we don't think about death. We always think we're going to live forever. And that is one of the reasons why the, the military is made up mostly of younger people, 18-year-olds to in their early 40s a lot of times. And that is because whenever you're that young, whenever you are living your life and you just feel so full of life, facing the end is not really on your mind. And you feel invincible. And there's a very thin line between being an idiot and being a hero. And sometimes the line gets a little bit blurred and confused. But I am so thankful that whenever we stop and we think about the young men and women who have faithfully served our nation, who have given of themselves, not just because they don't think they're ever going to die, but because they say, here's a blank check for the freedom of our nation, payable all the way up, even if it's my life. 
Jesus came into this world because he knew that we had so much more than just this old physical body in which we live in. We have a soul. And that's where we understand that whenever this physical body dies, it does not end the spiritual life. You know, we want to think about how it's going to be whenever we die. Woody Allen once said, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be here when it happens. And there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of us are not necessarily afraid of dying as much as what we stop and think about how that we might die. You know, there are some that have died and it has, I believe, been a shock that they closed their eyes and open up in the and they open their eyes at a moment and they were in the presence of God. Whoa! What just happened? But God also let some know your time is coming to a close. Your time is coming up. You need to get your house in order. And they're given a notice. And you often hear this from a doctor and says, you only have about this much time left to live. But I want to assure you this, none of us are promised that we're going to be able to have those words spoken to us. So how now shall we live? You live with your house in order as if this is your last day. I know that reality of death came whenever I was a young man serving in the military. Whenever a chaplain and also a paralegal came in to our squadron and said, okay, there are some things in which you need to get right. And we're here to represent two areas. One is if you want to get right with your maker, here's a chaplain. You also have legal obligations and duties. And this paralegal is to help you to be able to make out your will and to give you powers of attorney and to be able to help settle those things. You know, and I had to stop and I thought just for a moment as an 18, I might have been 19 already at the time. I never thought about filling out a will, but all of a sudden that reality was before me. And then whenever a war came, desert storm, a lot of guys were having to fill out those quick forms and, you know, and, and to be able to put it on there. Do you realize that, that also that there was a, a man and this has been able to be held up in court. There was a man who actually was involved in a car accident many, many years ago. He was pinned underneath his car, and he took something and he scratched in the side of the paint on his car. It says, I, and he wrote his name and said, everything that I own, I leave to my wife, and he signed it. And when they found his car and his deceased body, they legally said that wheel scratched out in the paint on his car stood in court and he, his wife was able to get it all. Let me assure you of this, get a will because if you don't determine what's gonna happen to all your stuff, the government will. And I'll also tell you this, if you don't get real particular about some things, you're actually setting your family up to have a feud. Well, mama said I could have this. Well, daddy said I could have this. And I, as the pastor, have been brought in to be a mediator of family members over stuff. Now, I can understand how precious sentimental things are. I have some things that belong to me that belong to my great-grandparents that are very sentimental. And there are some things that I want my children and my grandchildren to have, and certain ones, certain things. And so, but don't let that be the distraction of your life when it comes to an end. Let your family be able to celebrate your life, not fight over your stuff. You all with me, church? Because it even happens even to the best of church-going people. I've been there. Who do you think I've mediated these family feuds for? Church members. But most importantly, though, Instead of thinking about what mama or daddy or grandmama or granddaddy left me, I want them to be able to celebrate your life and who you were. I want them to be able to think about your love 
that you gave to them, but also your love for God because God first loved you. And then I want them to be able to continue on with the legacy in which you leave. You see, that is something that every single one of us is going to leave behind, and that is a legacy. You may not be able to leave houses and cars and jewelry and stocks and bonds and big bank accounts, but you will leave behind a legacy. Now, your legacy is either going to be filled with one or two things. Your legacy will only be filled with one of these others, but not both. And that is, your legacy is going to be filled with that of how to be selfish and self-centered. Mine! It's all mine! I did all this my way! Or it's going to be filled with love and gratitude and benevolence and giving. There's not an in-between. You say, well, they were always kind and giving to one, but they were always stingy with another. It, it, it doesn't mix. It's all in water. So let me ask you this. What do you want your legacy to be told about? Now let me, let me go back to this right here. Your legacy is often going to be filled with that of what kind of love did you show? Was it conditional love? I only love those people who love me. I can only like those people who like me. I only give to those people who can give something back to me. I only return favors whenever a favor's been done to me. Is that your kind of love? Or was it that unconditional love, like what Christ showed you whenever he saved your soul from hell? That unconditional love where you look beyond what a person may look like on the outside and realize that on the inside they have a soul. You see, and this is why Paul wrote this was because these false people that were coming in, these false teachers that were coming in, were teaching about how that you can be saved by your good works and how good you look and how good that you act and the good places you go to and the good things you do. Whenever in all reality, all of our good works are like filthy rags compared to God, we're only saved by God's grace. And that, that's where we know that too often we are only known by what is on the outside instead of what's really on the inside. But just like a well, what is on the inside is going to come out on the outside, is it not? Now... We have this thing called an earthly tent. This is what he talks about here in 1 Corinthians, I mean 2 Corinthians. And he compares our body to like that of a tent. What was a tent? It was a, it was a mobile house. We're just nothing more than just a mobile house. But yet inside of us is who we really are. I heard David Jeremiah share this little poem. He said there was a man who died one time, and his name was Solomon Pease. And on his tombstone, they wrote these words. Beneath these clouds and beneath these trees lies the body of Solomon Pease. But this ain't Pease, it's just a pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. <laughs> yes, this old pod that the Pease are in, it gets old. You know, it gets tattered. It looks a lot different over the ages. But on the inside of us, we're being renewed daily by God. You know, and, and whenever we die, the physical death, the body is left behind. But the spiritual body goes on. Now, it's kind of like the little boy that was walking down the seashore and he saw a dead seagull and he, and he picked it up and he ran to his mommy and he says, Mommy, Mommy, you know, the, the, the bird is dead. And the mommy thought for a moment, oh, this will be a good time to teach the little boy, my son, about death. And he says, Mommy, it, it died. And he says, well, yeah. It says, it went up to heaven to be with Jesus. The little boy looked at the bird and says, well, what happened? Did he not like it and throw it back? <laughs> now, understand this. 
there's, there's some of you, you might get to heaven and God might look at the body and say, mm, you know, no. That's why whenever God sees us, he sees what's on the inside. And this old shell of a body in which we live in is going to be left behind. But our, our soul, our spiritual body, will go to God. And there we're going to receive a new body, prepared for us by God, in a place called heaven that was built by Jesus, John 14. And so we know that God has prepared this way for us through Jesus. God has prepared a new body for us that will not have disease or age or, or the crippling things that are upon us, death or disease. But instead, he gives us that new body. But you know, one of the other things is, is this is also the beginning of eternal life. And that beginning of eternal life can only be found with Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain this to you. All of us have a body. All of us have a soul. At the moment of your death, <coughs> your soul, it will then enter into eternity. And that eternity will only be one of two places. It will either be heaven or it will be hell. Now, there is no in-between. There is no purgatory. There is no second chances. There is no great scales in the sky whenever you might think that you can talk God into something by trying to throw all your good works onto the scales. But instead, what we must look at is that it's either going to be heaven or hell. And in order for you to go to hell, let me tell you what you need to do. Absolutely nothing. That's all you got to do. Absolutely nothing. And that is that we have that sin nature in us that has drawn us away from God. And that sin nature is what causes us to know that the Bible has said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do not believe the lies of Satan and believe that you've been a good person your whole life. You've sinned. And the wages of those sin is death, and that's the eternal separation from God. But it's not just the end. It might be the end of your life, but it won't be the end because then you're into eternity in a place called hell. But the free gift of God is this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ died for us, making a way for us to then be able to go to heaven. And the way in which we're able to do that as that he says that if you'll believe with your heart that, Je that God rose Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And whenever you're saved, then you can know that whenever your time is up here on earth, whenever you breathe your last, whenever your heart has pumped its last beat, Whenever your brain has had its last waves and you are instantly in the presence of God, you'll know it, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross and shedding his blood for us. Have you called on the name of Jesus? Do you know him? Jesus today is softly and tenderly calling you to come to know him. And to be able to have this eternal life in which he desires to give you. But one of the things that a lot of people think about is, is like, okay, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm going to give my soul to God so that I avoid hell. And what you want is just fire insurance. But you don't want to live for him today. Brothers and sisters, you've missed the whole point of salvation if that's your whole intention of salvation. And that is that Jesus desires to not only be your Savior and save you from hell, but he also desires to be the Lord of your life. Because there's so much more in which he wants to do in your life today. He wants to give you life that is abundant life. He wants to give you a life that has reason and has purpose and has meaning. 
He wants to give you a life in which he can use so that whenever it's your time to go, people will be able to talk about your life and the difference in which you made for them. They'll be able to talk about your love, and that is how the Christ's love changed your love for all mankind, and then also the legacy in which you leave behind. Could your family say, my loved one was a follower of Christ? Not just a believer in Christ, a follower of Christ. Hear what the Spirit is saying to you today. Where are you on life's journey? Here's the truth of the matter. Just like all books, just like all roads, just like all movies, they all come to an end. Your life will come to an end as well. And then what? Eternity. So as Michael comes and leads us in this song, as we prepare our hearts for communion, if God is speaking to you today, don't turn him away. Answer his call. Come to his salvation. I'll be here at the front. This altar is open. You come. Let's stand. sing that invitational song solo and I want you to let God examine your heart and make sure that you are partaking of this communion as the scripture says in a worthy manner what does that mean it means that you are taking this because you know Jesus not just about him but that you know him if you don't know Jesus as being your savior do not partake. And then also, brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we know that our sins have been cleansed and that we are confessed before God and that we're desiring to not just be a haphazard follower, but a, but a follower of Christ <clears throat> each and every day. And this communion brings us back to remind us of just such a calling he's put into our lives. So as Michael sings, you pray. Oh, 
prepare our hearts, Lord, as we come now, Lord, to this time of worshiping you through that of the observance of your last supper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your element there with you, if you're going to move back to the top and pull out the bread. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. I ask if you would, would you take this piece of bread in your hand and will you silently thank God for the body and for the life of Christ? Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Will you take just a moment and thank God for Jesus' blood that was shed so that we could have forgiveness? Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come, Lord, in humble adoration to you. Father, whenever we stop and we think about what it took for us to be able to have real freedom, it took your son, Jesus Christ, dying a death for us on Calvary's cross. And that is why, God, he is truly our hero, our Savior. And, God, we desire to make him our Lord each and every day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. That, Lord, whenever we were so unworthy, you saw fit to call us into your family. Father, we thank you, God, for your forgiveness. That, Lord, though my sins be as scarlet, you washed them white as snow. God, we thank you, Lord, that whenever we thought that we had a good life, you came and showed us that, Lord, that you could give us eternal life. God, whenever we felt that we were all alone, you showed us that you would never leave us nor forsake us. God, so many wonderful blessings in which you have given to us. Thank you, God, for the freedoms in which we have in you. Thank you, God, for setting us free from the bondage of sin. Thank you, God, for setting us free to be able to spend eternity with you. So, God, this week and every day, we want to do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Pray that you have a safe day, an enjoyable day, because those who died did so so that we could have an enjoyable time. But don't forget to pause, remember, reflect, and to give God thanks. Let's stand together for our benediction this day. And it's actually the closing of this text from which we read about communion. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And all of God's people said, Amen. and for those of you that are working with VBS, the meeting is upstairs. In the